الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um okay so my talk is about um uh, power of knowledge um so i thought i'd begin before defining what علم is um basically i find anyway that if you if you mention a little bit about something very vaguely and then define it it's a lot easier to comprehend what it means so or to conceptualize what it means so um an imam abdul rahman al awzai does anyone know who al awzai was no okay well everyone knows the four imams right abu hanifa imam shafi there was the four imams and then there was another four imams there's actually more but there were four main other imams who were just as great as the four imams so you could say shadow four imams they were um, abdullah ibn mubarak al layth ibn sa'ad ibn abi layla and al awzai yeah and he had his own method as well um which by chance didn't go as far as Imam Malik's method did um, because Imam Malik's method was institutionalized but if it wasn't Al-Awzai's method would be what everyone knows anyway Al-Awzai said that knowledge is that which the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam conveyed and anything else is not to be considered ilm or knowledge Imam Ahmad and Imam Az-Zukhri who were very very scholars um, themselves um, agreed with what Al-Awzai said and they, add, they added what the salaf conveyed to the definition as well So just to illustrate um, what it is. You have the Quran, you have the Sunnah, and knowledge of the Quran. That's the Quran, that's the Sunnah. And knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah was passed by the Prophet Sallam to the Sahaba, who then passed it on to the Salaf. So Allah Azza is saying that knowledge is everything in between them. Whatever is in between here is pen, right? So. Ibn Rajab al-Hamali, who himself was a very great scholar, particularly in the hadith, he defined the ilm as following the texts of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, understanding their meaning, confining oneself to what has been reported from the Sahaba, the Salaf and the Khalaf in matters to do with the Qur'an, hadith, al-halal, al-haram, etc, etc. Right, so this is basically the broad definition of what ilm is, which is pretty much everything between them. And you could probably conclude that it's pretty exclusive, right? According to his definition, things like chemistry science um, law commerce doesn't come under the fold of of ilm which it does but I'll explain that in a little bit um, and this definition is very specific as well and this is because the divide of knowledge the scholars have divided knowledge into two branches yeah one branch is knowledge um, that benefits and the other no- and the other type of knowledge is that which is not benefit and this division comes from um, a hadith which says some forms of bayan a magic and some knowledge is ignorance so bayan means speech but that's a separate discussion we're more concerned with knowledge and the professor is saying that knowledge is ignorance and that's it's it's passing because knowledge by definition removes ignorance so how can knowledge be ignorance um ibn as-sahwan who was also a great muhaddith he says that um some knowledge is ignorance means a scholar or person in general burdens himself with taking knowledge of that which is not concerning him by which he becomes ignorant. So basically um in our definition of ilm which is underpinned by a benefit if you're concerning yourself with that which is not benefit you then Ibn Rajab says that you would be better off having not known what you knew. And a classic example is gossip, yeah. Suppose you hold a brother in high esteem. And this is it's actually a personal example. I used to hold a brother in in great in great um, esteem and then someone told me something about him and normally you shouldn't be gossiping but I mean he just randomly told me something about him. And then the thing the way that I used to see that brother in terms of taking his advice considering his advice it completely you see it was undermined and in that case I must have admitted so many great lessons he could have told me which I undermined by what I knew of him so therefore I would have been better off had I not um been aware of that knowledge which was given to me and <coughs> sorry I'm sick and then now um onto onto what I was mentioning before about science and commerce um not being ilm which affects us ibn al-athir says that in the hadith that i mentioned earlier it is also said that um one one burn that which he is not need of burn such as astronomy at the same time ignoring what he is in need for his religious life such as the quran and the sunnah comes under that fold now i think it's, it's probably worth it to explain this statement a little bit this doesn't mean for example i'm studying commerce law that doesn't mean that all my knowledge in commerce and law is just it's useless religiously 
Um, Brother Adam, for example, is studying history. It doesn't mean his knowledge in history is useless either. And whatever we're studying doesn't mean it's useless. What it means, because this itself has a spiritual underpinning, it's a sacred duty on us, it's a, it's a fund to be able to provide for our families and just earn a living. Rather, what it means is, if I was to dedicate all my time in um, researching the company Lipton, yeah, it's, it's useless, it has no spiritual benefit at all. So if I found out the history of Lipton, who came up with it, and I just spent all my time researching Lipton, as opposed to when I could have been um, using that time to learn fiqh, to learn the Quran, you know, um, perfect my tajweed, etc. That's when knowledge becomes detrimental. That's what it means. Yeah. So don't think that our studies in from university is comes under that fold because it's actually far kifay. Imam Ghazali says that it's far on every single Muslim to have on the Friday Muslim Muslim Ummah to have experts in each of these fields. So we have to have specific type of heart surgeons and engineers, etc. Um, and this goes to the extent that even Arabic has been disliked to go excessively into it. Even Arabic, and this is according to Imam Ahmed and Qasim ibn Muhammad, who was a great scholar of the Salaf. They said they dislike studying Arabic too deeply, too intricately, because you don't need to know that well. And in fact, they said um, you should know Arabic to the extent that you can appreciate the miraculous nature of the Quran, the ajaz of the Quran, and just understand what Allah is saying. And beyond that, there's no need to know. And Imam Ahmed says about Arabic, and this applies in general as well, he says um, Arabic language is like salt on food. You take as much as you need to appreciate the food more, but too much would spoil it. So imagine if you, you, know, you have like a bowl of rice or chicken or something, and you just pour 500 grams of salt, you destroy the taste. Likewise, your alien can be destroyed as well if you um, place too much on it. Um, <coughs> Now, as for Elam, that, that's just a sort of preliminary introduction as to what Elam is. The more interesting part is what benefits you can derive from Elam and the necessity Elam has for Ibadah. Allah SWT says in the Quran that um, He basically says, are those who know equal to those who do not? Meaning, are those who have knowledge equal to those who do not have knowledge? And it's obviously a rhetorical question. Um, the one who knows and acts upon his knowledge is far greater than that one who does not. Um, and Sufyan al said, Sufyan al was also a great scholar. He, um, Imam Shafi, he said, knowledge, this is Imam Shafi, one of the greatest scholars of this deen. He said, knowledge revolves around three people. They are Sufyan al Thawri, Abdul Rahman al Awzad, as I mentioned before, and Hamad bin Salama. Sufyan al said, do not even scratch your head unless there is athar for it. Athar is uh, basically, the scholars of Usul al Fiqh have this, di divided um, the sayings of the Salaf and the Khalaf into two categories. There's Khabar Mawkuf which is the sayings of the Salaf, and there's Athar, which is um, the sayings of the Khalaf. But back in Sufyan al time, it was all one thing. So he said, don't even scratch your head unless it's Athar for it. And obviously, it's not being literal, like you can scratch your head without knowing the, the need for it. But he's saying anything which is like it's related to Ibadah in nature, make sure there is the need for it. And obviously, um, the way to do that is through Adam. Now, <coughs> the merits of Adam, this is the most um, sort of interesting part of of knowledge and what I'm going to do here, this is probably the greater portion of my talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate what Adam does, the benefits of Adam. Um, but before I do that, just to give you sort of a, a preliminary understanding, there was a scholar from the Salaf named Abu Ali al Riyahi. He was a great scholar of the Quran and he's one of the most authoritative um, sources of knowledge when you talk about the career of the Salaf. Anyway, Abu Ali al Riyahi, he came to Ibn Abbas's circle, Ibn Abbas used to have circles. Um, of knowledge and he teaches various people. Abu Ali al Riyahi, he was one of the senior scholars, he came to the circle and he sat down somewhere at the back because it was late. And then Imam, uh, sorry, Ibn Abbas, he paused and he told Abu Ali al Riyahi to come up and to sit next to him, which was like, he had like cushions and stuff, but a comfortable seating. And then when he came and sat down, he said, Ibn Abbas said, This is how knowledge empowers people. This is how knowledge empowers people. And just keep that in mind because it doesn't make sense later on. Um, Ibn al-Mubarak, who I mentioned earlier, was one of the great um, Imams, on par with the four Imams. His fame, he had excessive fame. Like, we might not know about him, but if you were living at that time, not a day would go past except that you heard Ibn al-Mubarak's name. His circles were so big, Ibn al-Mubarak's circles were so big that people, there'd be so much people that they would lose their sandals, and the stampede of the people's feet would create huge dust clouds, to the extent that People that would be observing from the outside, they think an army was invading. 
And this was just because they wanted to learn what Ibn al-Mubarak had to offer. Abdul, Abdul Razak, who um, he's a great hadith, he, had, he has his um, own book on uh, Kitab al-Sunan, which is books of hadith. Um, <coughs> he was so famous that people traveled to see Abdul Razak more than people traveled to see the Prophet That's quite incredible. Obviously, it's, it's relative because um, there were more Muslims at Abdul Razak, Razak's time than there was at the Prophet's time, but still, it's quite an achievement. And I keep in mind that this shouldn't be your aim of knowledge to have you know, massive circles. What um, the scholars mean when they say knowledge gives you respect and status is that your word can be used to elevate the status of the deen. It's not to, to, you know, to, to um, accentuate your ego or anything like that, it's to serve Allah's deen. So that's what knowledge empowers you with. Furthermore, Prophet said, when Allah wishes well for a person, He grants him fiqh in his deen. Fiqh means, the linguistic meaning of fiqh is understanding. So when Allah favors you, He will give you fiqh in His deen. And what does fiqh do? Fiqh um, optimizes ibadah. And it ensures that you gain the maximum amount of reward you can from your daily rituals. Now on the point I was mentioning before about knowledge empowering people, think to yourself, who would scholars like Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi and Ibn Taymiyyah, who would they be had knowledge not empowered them. If they, suppose they went to trade and they just died, and would we, would we know about it? No, of course we won't. Whereas Abu Hanifa and Shafi and the four Imams are one of the most common you know, people in the field of knowledge. And sorry, in the field of Islam. So, would we know about it if they didn't seek knowledge? They'd be insignificant people which we never heard of, we wouldn't care to know about, they just died as another you know, number throughout history. But that's not the case. I mean, Abu Hanifa will be his name will be sort of heard for until the day of judgment. And in fact, some crazy scholars even say that you have to seek Allah's mercy every, mercy every time you, you mention Abu Hanifa. It's not right, but I'm just saying this is the, the status that was granted Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi and others. Next point. Um, <coughs> Ibn Abbas said, when an individual walks a path of knowledge, Allah paves a path to Jannah for him. So if you're training the path of knowledge, what Allah will do is He will redirect you to the path of Jannah. So knowledge itself is a pathway to Jannah. Amongst others, Salat for example, praying tahajjud, various dua, knowledge is one of them. Um, Adam tells you how to worship Allah properly and it clarifies the path to Jannah. So, um, one of the best ways of illustrating this is a hadith, Sahih hadith in Abu Dawood, where the Prophet says, he, he who says, رَضِيْتُ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّنْ وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَبِنَبِيُّ مُحَمَّدًا It becomes wajib on him to enter paradise. Imagine that. Imagine it's obligatory upon you to enter Jannah. Just by saying that little three-second dua. Now imagine you knew all of these things. How much would it increase your chances of, of um, getting into Jannah? This is what knowledge can do to you. Or for you, actually. Um, <coughs> so, in saying that, what knowledge does to you is, and I've seen this with my own eyes, um, with various teachers and things like that. What knowledge does to you is, it instills this element of sincerity which can't be attained any other way. Like, regardless how much you pray at night and cry and this and that, you cannot achieve the status that, or the taqwa that knowledge instills into you. And what I'll do now um, is go and I'll, I'll, um, I'll list through the greatest, some of the greatest scholars that have lived and the level of piety they achieved. So we'll start by Sayyid bin al-Masayyid. Does anyone know who Sayyid bin al-Masayyid is by chance? Okay, well, we all know the Salaf here. Yeah? The Salaf of the generation that followed after Sahaba. When you say Salaf, and the scholars of the Salaf, you're probably referring to a lot of scholars, but mainly there's four or five scholars in particular. Sayyid bin al-Masayyid, according to a lot of great scholars, was the greatest scholar from the Salaf. Imam Ahmed um, bin Hanbal, for example, he was asked who was the greatest scholar from the Salaf. And he replied, Sayyid bin al-Masayyid. Sayyid bin al-Masayyid, because of his knowledge, for 40 years, 40 years, he did not miss a single prayer in Jama'ah in the Masjid al Haram. For 40 years, imagine that. Like, I knew, I knew someone that he prayed one year without missing a single part of prayer. And I was impressed. I was like, that's, that's very good. But Sayyid bin al-Masayyid, not only did he not miss a single prayer in 40 years, but he also prayed in Jama'ah. Further than that, he also did Hajj 40 times, one every single year. Murat al-Khayr. Another scholar from the Salaf. He would pray 600 rakta of Nawafi prayer every single day. 600. Every single day. And Murat al Khayr is actually <coughs> his punya. Because wherever he went, he would bring khayr, he would bring blessing. 
Hassan al Basri, one of my favorite scholars from the Salaf, and easily one of the greatest, for 20 years, 20 years he did not make a single action, he did not enact a single action except ensuring that it was for Allah. And in the narration it says that he would, with, he would extend his hand to pick something or do something, and he'd stop and he'd think whether this was for Allah, and if it was, he'd continue, and if it wasn't, withdraw. Not a single step. He wouldn't go like this unless it was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Hassan al Basri. Al Qaman bin Qais. Probably he was equal to Sayyid bin al Masayyid. His son, Abdul Rahman, he would pray 700 raqqa of Nawafil prayer every single day. And he was considered the worst of the worshippers in the family. The worst of the worshippers. 700. I probably haven't even prayed that in my life. And he prayed that every single day. SubhanAllah. Ata ibn Abi Rabbah. He was a student of Ibn Masood and a great scholar of the Quran. It was said that the mosque, the, the floor of the masjid, was his bed for 20 years. For 20 years, he stayed up every single night, all night, <coughs> praying to Hajjud. <coughs> and it was said that he had a particular spot he used to pray and it was always wet. No matter what time of the day he went, he'd always be wet because of his crime. And the same in Fadl Zali as well, who I mentioned earlier. Al Layth ibn Sa'ad. My favorite scholar actually, he said he, he would feed 300 poor people every single day. Every single day he would feed 300 poor people. SubhanAllah, I, I, I've never even fed 30 people in my life, let alone 300 every single day. So that, this is just the spiritual tranquility that these scholars brought. As for, it also helped them interpersonal skills as well, like um, articulation, expenditure of time, time management, etc. So looking at time and how the scholars how um, dearly they viewed their time. The Prince of Scholars, um, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, the great Mufassir and Muhaddith as well, he would be, his time was so valuable that he orchestrated every single second in his, in his um, life to facilitate knowledge, even through his sleep. He would be learning while walking, he would be learning while eating, and he would be learning while sleeping. I know how, it's it called subconscious learning, but he would be learning even while he was sleeping. That's incredible. He didn't even want to waste time sleeping. Ibn al-Nasif, who was a great scientist and he has um, a lot of scientific contributions, he would have pens sharpened for him. So when one broke, he wouldn't waste time having to make another one. So those few seconds, the three or four seconds it takes to move your head, pick up another pen, continue writing, were so valuable that he pre-prepared that. Every second was that valuable. Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, the great um, uh, Mufassir, he wrote Mufatih al ghayb which is a famous tafsir. He used to regret and feel bad. The regret of his life was the time he spent eating. That was the big. That's the only thing you could find to regret. The time he spent eating. That's how valuable the time was. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. He would soak his bread in water to eat it to say to shave a couple of seconds off the total time um, spent in eating. A couple of seconds was for these guys probably enough to write two or three books. Um, that, that's how. Not really. That's how valuable the time is, subhanAllah. As for humility, it instilled magnitudes of humility we can't even comprehend. Like, you might see someone that's very humble, you know, he's in the mosque, he's, he prays and he goes, and you think, oh, mashallah, this brother, this brother is humble. But true humility was instilled in Sufyan bin Thawri. Sufyan bin Thawri, he was a great scholar, and he used to have massive clouds, uh, crowds like Abdul Razak and Ibn Mubarak. Every time a cloud would pass over his head, he would be silent, he would be silenced until the cloud passed. And when he was asked why he did that, uh, why he did that Sufyan Al-Thawri said, I was scared that a rock might come down from the, um, uh, from the clouds and strike me because of the, the sharq that I say. This Sufyan Al-Thawri, one of the greatest scholars of this deen, he was afraid when his clouds would go past. I didn't even notice when the clouds would go past. I'm sure none of us do. Yeah, um, Sufyan Al-Thawri would be silenced. Ibn uh, Rabiat al-Rai, he was... Sayyid Sa bin al Masayyib, as we alluded to earlier, was probably one of the greatest scholars from the Salaf. Rabiat al Rai, if anyone can compete with him, it's Rabiat al Rai. And he was, his, Rabiat al Rai is his nickname because he would practice more ijtihad than Sayyid bin al Masayyib. Um, Rabiat al Rai, when you, someone of such great knowledge, that's who you go to ask questions. When he was asked questions, his response would be, I seek refuge from your evil. That's how precautious he was in, not, in eliminating the chances of him saying anything wrong out of his mouth. He would say, I seek refuge from you, from your evil, and he walk away. SubhanAllah. Ibn al-Mubarak. <coughs> Ibn al-Mubarak, he borrowed a pen once from Mer in Asham. Yeah, he borrowed a pen, and he forgot to return it. And then he, he used to live in Maru, which is um, Central Asia. So he borrowed a pen, and he went all the way back to Maru, and he remembered that he still had the pen. And he went all the way back 
And we didn't have planes and cars and stuff. You had to go by camel, which is like a two, three week journey. He went all the way back to return that specific pen. SubhanAllah, so just to return that little pen, he took a three, two or three week journey. And he was a rich man, he could have just sent you know, a box of pens to him. But he wanted to make sure that he returns that exact pen for whatever liability he could incur um, on the day of judgment. So this is um, a brief, literally it's, it's a very, very brief illustration of um, what the levels of piety that, that, that our knowledge can, can um, give to you. I read a book actually called, um, and you should all read it, it's called Pioneers of Islamic Scholarship. And it goes through um, <coughs> the famous imams that achieved the status of Mujtai Mutlaq, which is the level of Abu Hanifa and uh, Sufyan Thawri. And in that book, it mentions that primary scholar and all the other scholars and what they did. And this is probably all this, what I just mentioned, is probably one or two pages. And this entire book is 272 page book and it's filled with these things. And this is only what he was aware of. So, this, I mean, you can, you can imagine what the scholars, what level of piety they reached. And they reached this level of piety because of their knowledge. Only because of their knowledge that they reached this. <coughs> so that's just a brief look, a snapshot at the level of piety that that, that Ilm can give you. Now, um, Imam Shah Ali Allah, he says in his book, Al-Mithi Sab, that um, the period of the Salaf, they were intellectually endowed by Allah, they were gifted, because this was the period in which God was writing. Shah Ali Allah says that, um, according to the authority of Suyuti, um, who himself was a great scholar, Jalaluddin Suyuti, that the Salaf, because after the, the, the Sahaba and after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowledge needed to be preserved. The preservation of Hadith and the, and the writing down of the Quran, this occurred in the period of the Salaf. So, Allah needed to ensure that this period of, of scholars were very, very sharp intellectually. To the extent that Abu Hanifa's teacher, Al Shabi, um, Al Shabi said that I remember the pages that I, that I read as a kid, as a child, on paper, as if I read them yesterday. That's how sharp his memory was. And this was according to all the scholars. Hassan al Basri, he said that <coughs> indeed, the scholars of our time would have mem books memorized in our um, heads. Entire books memorized in our heads. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endowed the people of the Salaf specifically for Adam. And this isn't restricted to the Salaf either. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He does is he, anyone that treads the path of knowledge, Allah allows that same level of intellectual endowment. And I was looking for this hadith yesterday. I read it in one of the books, but I couldn't find it. Um, so if you're interested in knowing what the hadith is, you can um, take my details and I can text it to you. But the meaning of the hadith imparted that Allah, if an individual, he seeks the path of knowledge, if he seeks the path of knowledge sincerely, wanting to um, elevate himself in terms of ilm and help the people, then Allah will gift you with in uh, talents, intellectual um, abilities to help you and to assist you in that. And the greatest example of this is Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari was born blind. That's pretty shocking considering Imam Bukhari was. Imam Bukhari was born blind. And he only, his eyesight was restored because Imam Bukhari's mom, his mother, she, every single night she would make dua that Allah restore his eyesight so he can, um, he can, uh, like, he can seek more knowledge and his memory as well. He can sharpen his memory. And one night, Imam Bukhari's mom um, had a dream that Prophet Ibrahim came to him, came to her, sorry, and... <coughs> and said that your, your wish has been granted. Go check on your son. So she went and she would check on his son and his son could see. And then Imam Bukhari turned out to be one of the greatest muhadithin um, this, this Ummah has ever seen. So this is what it means when... And, uh, another example is Imam al-Dabri. Imam al-Dabri, um, he was seven years old and he transmitted the entire Kitab of Sunan of the Razak. And he was seven years old, subhanAllah. Imagine kids seven years old transmitting entire books. And to transmit a book at that time, it's not as if you just read a book and say it. You have to know the 4,000 hadith which are in Kitab al Sunan Abdul Razak. You need to know its chain of narration. You need to know, and each one has five or six chains. You need to go, so and so reported from so and so. As well as the hadith, you need to understand the hadith. You need to understand the sciences of Mustala al Hadith, which itself has 102 sciences. It's Ghalib al Hadith, Khilaf al Hadith, Asma al Rijal. You need to know all these 102 sciences before you're given permission to transmit a book. And Imam al Dabri was seven years old. When he, and he was able to do this, seven years old. I don't think there's any scholar today that was even half as great as Imam al So this is what knowledge intellectually gifts you with. <coughs> the last point on the merits of Elam is that dua, 
Dua is only accepted if one is avoiding the halal, is only avoiding the haram, and fulfilling the obligations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, it's a condition for dua. You, can, you only have the right to make dua if you're staying away from everything he has prohibited you from and enjoying everything he has obligated upon you. Now, I'm sure all you guys could tell me at least three or four obligations that I'm not doing and three or four haram that I'm engaged in because of my lack of knowledge. So, I shouldn't be surprised or if I make dua and it's not answered because um, knowledge itself, knowledge is a gateway to having your dua um, answered. To the extent that when the scholars make dua, it was answered almost the next day. There's been, <coughs> there's been scholars, there's actually a Sahaba who was very knowledgeable. Um, he, was, he said he had two gifts. One was his speed and the other was his dua. Um, focusing more specifically on his dua, one time he heard a man that was creating fitna, um, saying things, um, aspersive things against the Prophet and he went up to the man and he said, stop, um, sort of, stop saying things against the Prophet or I'll make dua against you. And then the man said, um, you know, who the hell are you? Are you a prophet or something? That's what I say as well. If someone came to me and said, I'll make dua against you, I'd say, go away. You know, like I care about your dua. So this scholar, uh, this uh, sahaba, he went back home, he made wudu, he prayed two rakat and nawafin, and he said, and he made dua against the man. The second that he finished making the dua, a camel came, I have no way, a camel just randomly appeared. He came and um, he came to the circle of the man and he kicked him down onto the ground and he stomped on him until the man died. And when the people described the camel, they said that it was as if it was in search of something. This was the camel. And this is the power of dua. And this is the power of knowledge which is linked to dua. So this is what um, this is the power of alim. And it's not an exaggeration for the scholars when they say that the not the, the, the deen revolves on our knowledge. And a few hadith, like Ibn Salah says. <coughs> As for seeking knowledge, so what we've talked about so far is the theoretical benefits of knowledge. But seeking knowledge is an entirely different matter. One of the scholars, Ibn al-Mubarak, who I've talked about quite a bit, he devised a sort of a paradigm of, or the order in which knowledge is, is um, sought. And he says, um, he says that knowledge begins with intention. Actually, I should probably write this down. He goes, intention. To listening, to understanding, to applying, to preserving, and finally to spreading. Right, so this is the sequence that knowledge follows. <coughs> And to optimize your knowledge seeking, that's the sequence that I must follow. So, um, let's deconstruct these and see how it applies. Intention. Now this seems like it's a very obvious point. Um, we seek knowledge for Allah, but it's actually not. Because Sufyan Authority said, I spent 30 years perfecting my intention to make sure it's for Allah SWT. 30 years. And this is Sufyan Authority, one of the greatest scholars of the deen. Imagine us, we, you know. So it's not a small deal. Like, intention is a very, very big deal. Mujahid, who was, Mujahid was known as Imam al-Mufassirin and he's possibly the greatest scholar in Qur'an that has ever existed after the, after the um, Sahaba. <coughs> he went through the Qur'an, cover to cover, three times with Ibn Abbas and he made sure he knew where the verse was revealed, who the verse was revealed to, what are the implications of the verse, of the verse, the tafsir of the verse, etc. Mujahid said, um, we sought out this knowledge when we did not have a very strong intention Later on, Allah provided us with good intention. So even Mujahid had ulterior intentions before he saw knowledge. <coughs> As Sufyan al said to us before, he said, We started off seeking knowledge for other than Allah, but knowledge refused to be sought for other than Allah. So if your intention is to seek knowledge for any other reason, you won't prosper. You will not get anywhere. That's why the only scholars that we hear of that have knowledge are the ones that were sincere. And those that were, that were not sincere, we never heard of because they never went too far. So, intention is the first key. And intention, all this, is contingent upon intention being correct. And none of this applies if you don't even have that right. <coughs> so, what is the intention of Alam? Imam Shafi says he is to assist us in um, better being able to worship Allah. So, Alam is the key to maximize your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, once your intention is um, sincere, we move on to listening. 
Now this thing is an obvious point as well, you're listening to me now. But it's not because a lot of, for example, my um, the, the, the efforts that I've expended for uh, seeking knowledge have been reading. And I've found the detriments of that very recently. Listening, or in Arabic it's called Samara. This is the primary way to learn um, the deen. To the extent that, and this is discussed in the, in the science of Mustad al-Hadith, um, Ibn al-Salah, who was one of the greatest muhaddithin that the Umm Najah had seen, one of four, um, he, write, he says in his book, um, Al-Muqaddimah Ibn al-Salah, that if you want to be a reliable narrator, um, a reliable narrator, so someone, suppose we were back, you know, uh, 1200 centuries, uh, 1200 centuries ago, and we were transmitting hadith to one another. Um, if you did not attain your knowledge by listening to scholars, you would not be a reliable narrator. You would not, if you had attained your knowledge by reading, you would not be a reliable narrator. This is the amount of emphasis and importance that's placed upon listening. So, <coughs> your primary knowledge has to come through listening. Next is understanding. And this again, it sounds like an obvious point, but it's not. Because a particular muhaddith, um, I forgot his name, but a particular muhaddith was very famous for hadith, and he transmitted a few hadith in one of his circles. And he transmitted it, and the students went away and did their thing. And 30 years later, this muhaddith was in another circle, and he heard that hadith being relayed back to him. And he said, By Allah, I only discovered the meaning of this hadith yesterday. 30 years it took him to understand the meaning of one hadith. Yet you have people quoting hadith left, right, and center. Therefore, it's very important to understand the element and the implications of what you um, are seeking. And before you move on to applying, before you move on to applying, you must understand the subject matter before you apply, otherwise you're going to misapply it. And applying is probably the only obvious one out of this. Applying is just, you learn something, you apply. You know, I learned that it's good to um, rub your fingers in wudu thoroughly, therefore you apply it. Very simple. You wouldn't need to dwell too much on it. Preserving. This is an interesting one. And it's, it's, it's said that if every single book in this world was burnt, it, just, it was vanished, the only one that will survive is the Qur'an and some books of Hadith because it has been preserved so much that it's preserved in the mind through the various Ufad that exist. And the scholars of Islam have expended innumerable efforts in, um, in the preservation of Adin. To name a few, Imam Zuhri and Imam Ibn Hazm, <coughs> they compiled books on the subject of Asma al Rijal, which is uh, basically, it's the equivalent of encyclopedias, biographies, thorough comprehensive biographies of famous personalities that have existed, where they were born, um, where they traveled to, who they stayed under, what they learned, who they interacted with, who their students were, what they did, how strong their memory was. And we're talking about thousands of people. Imam, uh, Imam um, Azukri and Ibn Hazm each compiled a book with 4,000 personalities. And each personality is itself, you know, it's about 30-40 pages each. Um, Ibn al-Mizi compiled a book with 8,000 people. And Ibn al-Maqdisi uh, so uh, he compiled a book with around 10 to 14,000 people, which is imponderable. Like, even if we dedicate our entire lives, I don't think we could do that. So this is the amount of effort that has gone to preserving the deen. And it's very important that the knowledge that we seek is preserved. Because Imam al-Shabi, um, the teacher of Abu Hanifa, he said that, although my memory was <coughs> photographic, I have forgot a portion of my knowledge to the extent that if someone was to learn the knowledge that I've forgotten, he would be a scholar. Just the knowledge that he's forgotten, if someone were to learn that, he'd be a scholar. And I myself, in a very insignificant small scale, I've forgotten maybe 60-70% of what I've learned. And this goes for a lot of my uh, mentors as well. Uh, my chef, for example, his way of memorizing um, the knowledge that he's went to overseas and stuff to study, and uh, he's lost so much knowledge that he now writes books just to be able to, for the sole purpose of preserving his books, uh, sorry, preserving his knowledge. And um, I forgot the book. Um, it was Imam Ahmed actually, the, the uh, uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed. He said that my only reason for writing this book was so I can retain the knowledge in my mind. And Ibn Rushd, who was a great um, scholar, he has the most authoritative source in Fiqh. It's called Bidat al Mujtahid. And it's a two volume book, and it, it deals with every single um, issue in, um, in Fiqh. From everything, from what I'm allowed to you about that. He says that. Um, he says, my only reason for writing Bidat in Mujtahid was so I could retain all the information in my mind. And it's one of the most authoritative, it's the reference point. If you go to Medina or to Azhar to study Fiqh, this is the book that you go through. 
And he wrote that just to, to remember, to preserve his knowledge. So preservation is a very important aspect. And finally, spreading. Spreading is the last stage, <coughs> and it's the seal of, of knowledge in terms of um, purifying this, this space or this um, paradigm. Salman, the great Sahaba, he said, knowledge that is not spoken is like treasure that is not spent. So imagine um, you won the lottery, and you just did nothing with the money. It's just sitting in your bank account doing nothing. That's the equivalent of knowledge. You've amassed it, but you haven't conveyed it. You haven't benefited the people from it. You've only benefited yourself. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ said, the example of a man has acquired knowledge and does not speak about it is like a man who has wealth, but does not spend it. So you can see where Salman's statement comes from. But the point is, if you seek knowledge, and something's beneficial, then spread it. Spread the knowledge. Hence, the Prophet ﷺ said, convey from me even if it is an ayah. Convey from me even if it is an ayah. So even if you know one ayah and you think it's going to benefit people, convey it. <coughs> so that completes the paradigm that Ibn Mubarak devised as far as um, the order of seeking knowledge is concerned. Um, we started a bit late, so I can't go on to the next section. What I'll do is I'll skip that one and I'll go to um, the fifth point, which is the requisites of seeking knowledge. Um, these aren't properly codified by any scholars, but it's, it's implicit in their, in their efforts for seeking knowledge. Sincerity intention is already obviously covered by the likes of Sufyan Athori and Alayth. Arabic. Arabic is um, a very interesting one. And um, in my experience, and what my sheikh has said, and a lot of brothers that I know, you can't really um, sort of initiate the seeking knowledge without having known Arabic. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work like that. Why? Because the scholars, their medium of um, writing things down was Arabic. So we don't have access to all that. There are books translated, but for example, um, in Ul Ulum al Quran, the most authoritative book in that science is Kitab al Qan fi Ulum al Quran by Imam al Sayyuti. And it took 15 years for people to trans translate one volume. So, you know, it's going to take 30 years to translate one book on Ulum al Quran, let alone, you know, Zarqashi's book and Jalal din Balkini's book, etc. So we're missing out, we probably have access to 1% of scholarly, of scholarly work. So it's, it's unrealistic to think that you can be a true knowledge seeker, or a talib al a student of knowledge, without knowing Arabic. It's, it just won't work. And instead of just reading every single book in English, it's probably, you know, it's probably more efficient to just go in Arabic anyway. It takes about two years. Um, <coughs> that's why Arabic is known as mifta. Mifta means key. It's a key to accessing knowledge. And this is, um, this, Mifta, this term was coined by scholars that weren't Arab. They weren't Arab. For example, Sabawahi, who was a Persian, he didn't know Arabic, but he became one of the greatest scholars in Arabic. So, when you know Arabic, you have access to all this. You have access to Abit Qan, you have, you have access to Kitab Ma'anifa and other books on Fiqh and Hadith and, um, and, and Quran and stuff like that. So, if anyone's serious about seeking knowledge, then you should learn Arabic. First and foremost, learn Arabic. Because otherwise, you know, it's not futile, but you're far more inefficient. And this is um, coming from personal experience, the first few years of my uni, I was just, I was just inanely read books, thinking that I could actually get far in Arabic, but you actually can't. And you realize that after reading a certain amount of books, that you can only progress further if you learn Arabic. And I know some friends, they have bookshelves with like 100, 200 books, and they just stop reading and they focus on something else because they can't uh, elevate themselves any further through English. So instead of reading all those books and coming to that real realization yourself, you should learn Arabic. Secondly, and more interestingly, Arabic actually sharpens the intellect. Imam al shukba which is one of the greatest scholars of the Salaf, he said, learn Arabic, for it sharpens the intellect. <coughs> Ibn Abi Shayba, one of the greatest hadithin of the Salaf, said, learn Arabic, for it strengthens the intellect. And I was having a discussion with uh, one of my friends, who's sitting right there, um, and we were talking about the effect, how, we were trying to rationalize how Arabic can sharpen the intellect. And what we came up, and he actually told me that, Every time it's scientifically proven that if you learn a, if you learn a language, your IQ um, increases by five points, which is quite a, quite a big deal. Each language you learn. Why is this? Because language is a medium through which you articulate thoughts in your mind. Um, so, for example, let's say this phone. Tell yourselves that this phone is black. So actually, tell yourselves that this is an iPhone without using words in your mind. Just conceptualize what this is in your mind without using the words. Try it for 10 seconds. And you'll fail miserably. You just will. See, so what would have happened if you did it right is um, you would have got some vague, unspecific um, idea of this, what this is. You'd maybe a picture or some, some, you know, some description or something. But what you, what, 
See, it doesn't work because you guys know the language, so you can't, you know, it's not as um, effective. But the point is that language is the way you, you conceptualize thoughts and you structure it and you understand its description and its, its attributes and things like that. So, if one language, language has limitations, yeah? So, English, for example, might have limitations in a certain aspect, which is picked up in another language. And Arabic, through the attestment of non Muslims, is one of the most um, diverse and eloquent non, uh, languages in terms of being able to express itself and emotions and poetry. So, imagine um, that if you, if you were bilingual, you knew Arabic, you had the strengths of um, English, and wherever English failed or had limitations, you could pick it up in Arabic. So, if you're able to conceptualize something, to the language, because of um, its, its tools, you can conceptualize an idea better. So, for example, English, <coughs> if you, um, English, you might say, okay, well, it looks like this, its color is this, X, Y, and Z. Whereas in that language, the mode of description in that language might be more thorough and more comprehensive and more enlightened. So if you can conceptualize something in a more enlightened manner by way of your language, then you generally you've increased the internet. That's the way that's the rational explanation of how learning a language increases your intelligence. And that's why constructivists, they are communication scholars, they say that if you want to destroy a nation, if you want to destroy a, a, a nation or, or a, sorry, a, a race or a nation, you destroy its language. Destroy the ability to communicate and you end up destroying themselves. And that's how Islam, as its political force, was destroyed. Because the Arabic medium was so subsided that people couldn't uh, communicate properly and then the intellectual decline began from um, Arabic, and they say this to the extent that if you want to destroy, a if you want to destroy a profession, a particular profession, say for example engineering or law, you destroy the jargon that they use, the jargonistic words that is embedded within the profession. If you destroy that, you destroy the profession eventually. So this is the power of language, and this is why Arabic plays such a central role. And this is why, if you're serious about seeing Arabic, you should start with um, learning Arabic. And the last one is traveling or sacrifice. Traveling. Um, it sounds trivial, but it's basically a representation of, of sacrifice. <coughs> I think I've forgotten who the proverb, um, where the proverb came from, but it was something like anything that's worth something, you need to work for it. Nothing valuable comes for free. Same with Ellen. If you want to learn Ellen properly, then it requires tra uh, sacrifice. Traveling is only one way to, to demonstrate this. To the extent that Yahya bin Ma'in, who was, um, who was a muhaddith, and he was as great as Imam Muhammad, and more, he was greater in the science of Asma and Rijal, which is the biographies of narrators. He said that there are four people whom you cannot trust, and one of them is a man who writes hadith or studies hadith without leaving his town, meaning he hasn't expended the effort of travel to learn to seek earn. Al Kama bin Qais and Aswad bin Yazid, the two, Al Kama, Aswad and Sa'id bin Amasayyab, these three are the, the cream of the crop in the Salaf. These three are the greatest scholars from the period of the Salaf. al Qaman and Aswad, when they would hear a hadith from narrated by Amr, they would go all the way back to Amr, wherever they used to be, and <coughs> verify it. For every single hadith, Amr has narrated so many hadith, and for every single one, they would take months and, and weeks to travel and to attest that he actually said that. So, if your knowledge comes with sacrifice, without sacrifice and without effort, you won't get very far. And that goes for everything. Um, that deals with sort of the requisites. So we have intention and sincerity, Arabic, and sacrifice. A combination of these three should give you a pretty proficient sort of um, scale of, of seeking knowledge. Last last section, I have to skip another one because of lack of time. But, um, okay, five minutes. Okay, so this is just sort of from my experience and um, other, some of my friends' experience have, have progressed pretty far as far as seeking knowledge is concerned on side by uni, you know, without going to Medina and stuff. This is some techniques or some advice or tactics you can use to um, help you uh, begin your, your knowledge or, or further your knowledge. I started off, and a lot of my friends started off by learning Ulum al-Din. Ulum al-Din is the, a broad term which describes the sciences of Islam. Ulum al-Quran, Musal al-Hadith, Sul al-Fiqh, things like that. And I found that if you learn these things first, it provides a foundation or a basis within which you can understand Fiqh. You can understand the hadith and the context that might apply and just conceptualize these things much better. So I recommend you guys start by learning the sciences of, of Islam. On, this is on side with fiqh and, and hadith and Quran and things like that. Don't um, put them separately. <coughs> so 
study of the scholars, so the learning institutions like Albaya, Daraisha, um, Sharia program, things like that. Learn from them, but do not make it a primary mode of learning because simply it's too slow. Like it's a three year course, and by the end of it, you don't want to make that your only learning focus. So you should read books and discuss with one another on site by going to these institutions. And speaking about learning to one another is one of the most important things. And um, there's been instances where some of my friends, we get together and we talk about a particular, particular topic, and I chuck in what I know, and we, they chuck in what they know, and by the end of it, when we walk away from the discussion, I've understood that particular reality much more comprehensively. Much more comprehensively. That's because the, 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 um, but the, the benefit of speaking to one another about Elam is so much better than just articulating thoughts to yourself about it. So, you know, really reading the book to yourself, things like that. And that's why al Qaeda bin Qais said, remind one another of Hadith, for its indeed existence depends on it being mentioned. And the scholars in general have said, Hadith lives through being spoken about. So talk to one another, one another about Hadith. If you come across an interesting saying of, of the scholars, an interesting sentence or something, share it, you know, because it will, it will further your own knowledge. <coughs> Another way is to devise little um, knowledge circles. For then being Iyad, who was one of the greatest scholars and one of the greatest um, judges that had ever existed in this online, he said that we used to sit together at nights reviewing issues of fiqh with one another, with one another and we would start from fight from Isha and we would not get up until we heard the call for fajr because they were so engrossed in the learning and they were so um, sort of interested that they would not even realize the time had gone. And this is, I can, even for people like us who can't um, yet attain that level of piety, it, it, it applies even for us. Like I've sort of sat with certain people who are very knowledgeable and I've, I didn't even contribute, I'm just listening. And I wake up the next day with grief because that night has gone. Like that opportunity is so scarce that you have grief in your heart because it so rarely comes across. And the last point is to ask questions. Asking questions. And people that ask questions, on average, they understand that reality three times better than if they had got the answer themselves. Yeah? And this is what Umar ibn al-Khattab said, whoever's face is soft, his knowledge will be soft. And face is soft is a metaphor for um, being shy. If you're shy and you're too shy to ask questions because you think it's a bad question, or whatever, your knowledge will be soft. So keep that in mind. And Mujahid, Imam al-Mufassirin al-Mujahid, he said, the prideful person and the shy person can never acquire knowledge. If you're prideful and if you're shy, you can never acquire knowledge. And it was um, one of, a very wise brother once said to me that there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there's a stupid answer. So do not be shy of asking questions because this is by our own scholars and rationally and you know contemporary scholars, they all are unanimous on the fact that asking a question can only result in good. So with that being said, I'm going to conclude my talk there and progress into question and answer.